This is the hidden part of fishing film production that you rarely get to see. The nerve centre, the edit suite, where I get to finally cut and mix the shots. Today we're looking at the method by which most of us actually started our course fishing. Rod, reel, line and float, or more commonly known as the waggler. For reasons that will become apparent. We'll shortly join four times world course angling champion Bob Nudd as he guides us through this starter program. And if you follow the advice that Bob gives and remember the tips you'll see, I promise you, you'll up your catch rate without a doubt. This is probably one of the most economical ways of starting fishing. A simple waggler setup can cost as little as 30 to 50 pounds for a complete starter kit. And it's a great way for younger anglers to find out if it's going to be a sport for them without it costing a parent a fortune. Waggler fishing is also a good visual system for detecting bites. The action of the float can become quite mesmerising and the surge of adrenaline when it suddenly disappears out of sight is a good buzz. Let's head to sunny Norfolk and learn from a master. Oh, stay in again. Lovely fish. <laughs> Just a real gentle bite that time. Another one of these dream. Bigger one, I think. Oh, lovely fish. Oh, some action today. Look at this one. You know, even on this quite big fish, fairly light line, I'm very, very confident. My first fish of the day. I've come out today, I'm, I mean, this is a beautiful fishery. It's called, they're called Taswood Lakes. And only about, probably only about six miles to the south of Norwich, not far away, but absolutely beautiful countryside. Lovely and quiet and peaceful, birds are singing. This is a good fish by the feel of it. And the lake I'm fishing today, actually it's, it's more like a canal, it's probably 20 metres wide. It's called, it's called the Osprey Lake. Just one of a small, there's seven in the complex. What's this? Do you know what, it's a massive tench. I thought it was a carp, but it's a, oh, what about this for the first fish of the day? A beautiful big tench. And I've actually come here today to show you how to fish the waggler. A waggler can be a brilliant method, you know, if you, particularly if you're starting fishing. Not expensive. Do you know what I call these fish? Bars of soap. They're so hard to hold. There, look at that. Massive one. Just unhook him. Just got the hook. I'm only fishing with a 20 hook because I, I thought I'd put a fairly light... I want to fish a couple of waggler rigs today. I've put a fairly light one up. Fishing two maggots just off bottom and feeding casters. Look at that, eh? a three pound tent straight away. Beautiful fish. But waggler fishing itself, you know, it's a, it is a brilliant way to start fishing. Not expensive. And of course, when you catch a big fish like that, you can backwind on your reel, you can let it run, you can do whatever you want. So it's a different method. In fact, this is how we all started before poles come in. There was wagglers, stick floats, or feeders, and this, this actually is how I learned my craft, with a waggler. Now, it's not easy, you know, I know it's not easy when you first start fishing to have everything. I mean, oh, I've been fishing for years, so I've got everything exactly as I want it, but try as best you can. If you look at my setup, if you look at where I've got my keep net, nice and easy to put the fish in. I don't actually have to get up and walk 10 yards to put the fish away, I drop it into the net, without damaging it. I've got a rod rest to support the rod there, to support the waggler rod. I'm resting the butt on my knee. And I can actually have both hands free, like that. So that if I want to feed, both hands free for feeding. And what I'm doing at the moment, just loose feeding a few casters. And that early tench was great, but, but I'm actually getting the swim going. So I'm loose feeding, letting a few casters drop through the water. Like that, just keep loose feeding, keep working. 
And see where I've got my bait? There. I can pick up, get to all my bait without moving. So I'm really comfortable and it's so important to be comfortable when you're fishing. If you're comfortable, you catch more fish and you fish for longer. You know, you catch more fish, you're more comfortable, you don't want to go home early. So get yourself, get your setup right. Rod lovely there in the rest, ready to strike. Float, which is a visual mark to feed to. And what I'm trying to do, I'm fishing just off the bottom with this waggler, just off bottom. There is a few small perch, I'm told, in here that, that are a bit of a nuisance. So I've actually lifted, because I'm fishing maggot on the hook, I've lifted my bait off the bottom a little bit and try and get the fish to swim into this, this loose feed as it drops through the water. And as with all fishing, it just takes a bit of time as you're feeding to, to get the fish interested, to get them excited. And the good thing about waggler fishing is you've got so much flexibility. You know, you've got plenty of room if the fish wants to run, lots of flexibility, cast where you want, nice and easy. If it's a windy day, it doesn't matter. It's not like holding a pole. It's only a very, very, very light rod. But keep trying the same as whatever fishing you're doing, pick a marker on the far bank to cast to, keep your feed going in the same area, just dropping through the water all the time. And gradually try to work your swim up. Keep fishing, fishing, working. And, and as the day goes on, more and more fish will build up in your swim. Another fish. Not quite so big this one, but it, oh, I don't know, it's still quite a good fish. What I did actually then was I, this part, as I said, it's like a bit of a canal and it's shallowing up as you go across and it's very, very warm today. And I think the fish have moved on to that shallower water. And of course, this is a thing with a waggler. You can follow the fish, you can chase, you can go further out. You can try different parts. <laughs> there it comes, lovely, lovely bream about a pound. Beautiful fish. Two good fish straight away. That's a lot, well, beautiful quality fish, look at that. So just by going a bit further out, and would you believe I'm only on a, a very, very light hook length, only a smallish hook, two maggots, loose feeding casters, but two maggots, and a very light rig, and uh, I think it's a good idea, we're fairly early on in the program, to let you have a look at the rig itself. Look at that. Only a nice, lovely little bream, about, probably about a pound. The maggot, red maggot, just inside its mouth. Be very careful, I can just unhook that. No problem. With these barbless hooks come straight out, look at that. Perfectly conditioned. Beautiful little bream. That's a great start, isn't it? Let's start, I always call this the business end, the hook. I thought I'd start with a, with a, with a lightish waggler, so I've, I've matched it to a fairly light hook. This is one of my favourites. It's a Tubertini 808, a size 20. It's got a good gape on it, strong. It's just, just a good hook for, for catching everything. And then the hook length, now when you're using a hook length on a waggly, it's generally sort of a reasonable length, hook length, and this one is, is probably something like 18 or 20 inches, 18 or 20 inches long. I've put a little shot on the hook length, and I often do that, a number, you can just see it there, right in the middle, a number nine shot. I like to have a shot fairly close to the hook, so that I can actually see, that gives you indication of the bite. Now, this is what I use to join the hook length to the main line. It's a barrel swivel, number 30 barrel swivel, tiny, and I've got a tucked half blood knot each end, one with the main line going to it, one with the hook length. And this swivel, if you're fishing, say, with double maggot and you're spinning it back maybe 20 metres, it's like a ship's propeller as it's coming back through the water. And then this fine line, because it's only 012 millimetre diameter, this hook length, 012, that would spin up. So you need, you really do need that swivel. Then I've got 
the main line with another number nine shot. I've got two number nine shots actually down the line there. That barrel swivel is probably equal to a number nine, so it, it does take a bit of weight. I've got two number nine there, and then coming down to the float itself, and this, see this funny little attachment here? It is a float attachment, exactly what it says it is. And what it does is, there is an alternative you, alternative. you can put shots either side of the line to hold the float on, but this is just much better, stops the line being damaged. These two shots here are really just extra weight to balance the float. They're number three, non-toxics, but they're just to, to balance the float up. I've got a little link on there so I can change this float. These are incredible floats actually. They're, they're a, a Drennan called a loaded peacock waggler, so they're peacock. It's got the size on there, one and three quarter grams, which is just over two treble A for those people that like to talk in treble A's. But at any time of the day, I can un untake this apart, just unclip that there, just unclip that and put a bigger one on, say it gets windier and it's more difficult to control. I can, I can put a bigger waggler on. I can also just pull this insert out that unclips. So I can change the floats that way as well. A bigger float with the same weight and all these weights are clearly marked on the float itself. The actual size of the weight and you can interchange them and, and do whatever you want with them. Absolutely brilliant. So that's a, a really adaptable insert waggler. And an insert waggler is really what you use fairly light fishing, fishing on the drop, sensitive fishing. It's where you've got a thick piece of peacock going into a smaller piece. The main line itself is fairly fine. It's, it's 0.14 millimetre diameter. And I mark that clearly inside the spool. I actually write 0.14 millimetre so that I know on the different spools I have. And that's running up then and it's, you've got to match this line to the float. You know, if you try to use too heavy a line, the float won't cast. So keep the line fairly thin, but it's probably about four or five pound breaking strain. It's a, it's a browning line. It's a feeder line, but it's very, very strong. And that really completes this sort of light insert waggler setup. <laughs> this is brilliant fishing. Another one of those bream, I think. Oh yeah, smaller one this time, but oh, terrific. Look at that, lovely fish. Lovely quality fish. This is what fishing's all about, look at that. Doesn't want to come in, bream don't usually fight like this. Oh. Mind you, they're usually a bit better when you get them in the net. They're just slipped hooked again. Fabulous condition, fabulous condition. Look at that fish. But if we just slip hook it again, I can easily get that barbless hook out. Beautiful, that size we call skimmers. You know, it's probably just under a pound, so. But look at those beautiful jet black eyes. Look at the fins, black tinged, perfect condition. Lovely fish. I can see I'm going to have a great day. There's two ways to cast a waggler. It just depends how far you've got to go. You know, if you've got a really good distance, you've got to bang it, then you need an overhead cast. But quite often you can, you can just do an underarm sort of swing. And if you get it right, it's just a matter of timing. Your finger on the spool and hold the line two or three inches above the hook. Don't hold the hook because you might go out with it. And then it's just a, it's just a swing and a pivot. And as you get to a certain point, which is where you want your float to go, then you actually let go of the reel. So you round down and flick like that. And just as it hits the bottom, you can touch your spool there just to stop it. The line's out dead in front of you. And to sink the line, if you want the float to stay dead still in the position it is at the moment, if you put your tip under the water, just put your tip under the water and you can either flick it to the left or the right, it doesn't matter, but just flick it hard like that. What happens because you've, it's, it's the speed that you do it, 
pulls and sinks the line. And you need to do this when you're fishing a waggler because in windy, windy conditions, there's a little bit of wind today, line on the surface, the wind will pick it up and it will blow your float, it will move your float about and you need your float to stay still. The fish are aware. If a float starts kiting around the boat, the bait goes with it. They know there's something wrong so you won't get a bite. But you need to not always sink the line, but today we do need to sink the line. That's why I'm using a feeder line. I said I was using a feeder line. That is why, because it will sink quite easily. And then just go through this again. Look, I've got the rod resting on my knee, on the rod rest, two hands completely free to fire whatever I want. And I'm just, at the moment, just loose feeding a few casters, letting them drop through the water. I'm fishing a light waggler. So I need things to keep happening. And, and, and with fishing, it's always about feeding. Soon as you stop feeding, the fish lose interest, the loose offerings. You've just got to make them. Love all that extra, those bits of loose feed dropping through and they're quite happy. And then when they see your hook bait, of course, they go for that and then you've got them. And that, that really is the art of angling. Just feeding, little bite then, just a little touch, a little twist. They did warn me there was some small fish in here and I'm just hoping it's not one of them. They did warn me that there's some small, oh, it is one of them, one of those little perch. Somebody warned me, look. I saw the float, it hardly went under. Look at that. Oh dear, we won't count that one. It's a bit too small. I don't even know it got those two big maggots in its mouth. Little tiny perch. I'll slip him straight back, I won't even put him in the net. So it's all about feeding and just being smooth and comfortable. Oh, straight in again, lovely. <laughs> just a real gentle bite that time, another one of these bream. Bigger one, I think. Oh, lovely fish. Oh, <laughs> some action today. Look at this one. Lovely, just... And, and with this waggler, you, have, you do have a fair control. And, you know, even on this quite big fish, fairly light line, I'm very, very confident. Got a good light rod. I mean, not everybody can afford this sort of rod. It's a... It's a special one, it's a Browning Carboxy match rod. It only weighs five ounces. Look at that lovely bream. 14 foot, you know, so ultra light. Well, that's a bigger specimen. Nicely hooked though, hey? Look at that, hey? Another bream. Just hooked in the mouth, I can just see it down there. Use my disgorger on it. Try, always try and be careful with the fish. See how easy that hook came out? Beautiful condition. This is great fishing, isn't it? <laughs> Another fish. Well, this feels like a better one. I've been catching bream, but oh, this doesn't feel like a bream. Still on that fine line, though. You know, that 012 millimetre. And this is why a waggler's good. If you watch the reel, what can happen? As the, as the fish runs, you can actually backwind. Just bring this round. So I'm ready for that fish to surge off. I've got the anti reverse off. And I can actually backwind and let that fish, if it wants to surge away, let it run, wind it in. But I'm there ready all the time. I've got the clutch set as well. I mean, that's a final if I want to. You know, the clutch is just set for the real final. But I usually like to control the fish with the reel. It's a good fish, this might, might be another one of those tents. Look at that, rod is bent double. A, and that's, a, that's another good thing about a waggler, of course. You can put, look at that rod tip bending. You can put a lot of pressure on the fish. More so than you can with elastic. If you've got normal elastic, you just cannot put this much pressure on the fish. I'm getting it in, I'm trying to get it to get to the top and take that gulp of air. But you can land big fish with light tackle. <laughs> that is really banging away. Doesn't want to come up with a massive surge. 
I'm really, I'm giving it as much pressure as I can. This fish doesn't want to come in. When I first hooked it, I thought, well, I know it's not a bream, but what is it? It's a big fish. Look how I'm holding the rod. Look, it's just an extension of my arm. My arm's along there. So there, I can hold it with one arm. Can you see I've got my forefinger on the reel there? Just that is stopping the reel there. If I want it to, to let it run, I can just release it there, let it run, and then get onto the handle. So you can, you can play the fish completely off the reel. But when you want to put pressure on, just put your finger there and lift. Oh, this is a good fish. I think it's, I think it's a big tench. Let's have a look at the fish. What oh, is it is, it's going. One of those real big tench. Bigger than the first one I caught. Sure it is. Look at that. <laughs> but look how this rod handles it. Lifts it up. You can see the two maggots. Doesn't want to come in. Look at that. <laughs> a lovely fish. Terrific. What a fight. But very, very fine gear. I could let the fish run in complete control all the time. As I said, the bars of soap are really good. Look at the beautiful, it's sort of like a, an orangey, greenish tinge. Beautiful red, red rimmed and then the black eye. Perfect fins. And just a little bit of slime up the line. Terrific fishing. Can you see those two red maggots? Look, just, just there. Hook's only just on it. Here, let's unhook it. Just hooked. Might need to just put my disgorger on that just to make sure that it's, it's right in the top of its mouth, but sometimes it's it's easier to use a disgorger. What about that? Terrific fish. Whoa, talk about a hard fight. Let's just go through that cast once again. Important that you hold the line three or four inches above the hook. Don't hold the hook. What you have to do, and, and you've got your finger on the spool, so that keeps tension there. And what you do is you actually, if you can imagine it, you swing it, you keep the rod down fairly low, probably sort of something like 20 degrees. As you swing round, now when the tip of your rod gets to where you want your float to go, that's when you release your line. As the rod comes round, you release your line there. The float will automatically go dead straight then. If you release it too early, it'll go off at an angle. If you release it too late, it will go the other way. So you just have to get your timing right. And, and here we go, I'll just show you how you do it. Right, you ready? Just get round and away. And the float lands perfectly in front of you. You can just do that little sinking which I showed you. Just flick the, flick the rod hard and your float's ready. And then it, it's just so comfortable because you're fishing. As I said, this rod weighs five ounces. It weighs nothing. So because everything is so light, you've got a lovely rod rest there, resting on your knee. You've got your two hands free to just loose feed. So you can loose feed in comfort. And there the float goes. Oh, I don't believe that, I missed a bite. How can that be? It was probably one of those small perch because the bait, no, oh, actually it stole one of the maggots, so you never know. It might have been a big fish. You do miss bites. That is the, the thing with a waggler, of course. You, because you've got a fair bit of line, unlike a pole, you've got a fair bit of line from your tip to, to your actual float itself. You know, there is a bit of room there. You've got to pick up that little bit of line. That's why you need it sort of dead straight. You do miss the odd bite, but it's more than compensated in the fact if you hook a biggie, even a 20 pounder, you can get it in on this rig. Just thought then I'd just cast a bit further. And what's happening is those fish are definitely over in that shallow water. I don't know whether this is a carp or a tench. Hasn't woken up yet, I don't think it knows I've hooked it. Hooked it.
No, do you know what it is? It's a massive bream. Now my rod is top of the range, it's an advanced super match and as I said it only weighs five ounces. That's not necessary though, this is a, a 4.2 metre which is 14 foot, super light, very very soft oxygen so when I hook into a big fish you know, you've got plenty of elasticity on the tip itself, it's not too abrasive but I can still cast big floats without any problem at all. But it's just such a pleasure to use because it's so light. The reel fitting actually is a, you remember the old fittings where you used to have to push your reels and your reels would fall off halfway through a big fish? Well, this is actually a screw fitting on here where I can actually unscrew this to release the reel or screw it down to secure it. And it, it will not move at that, you know, it's really tight. And the reel itself is, it, once again, a, a browning. It's a Syntec 730 match. Now the match usually, when they say match on a reel, it usually determines the depth of the spool. So you get a match spool, which is very, very important. Most spools on reels are really deep and you have to put about three or 400 meters of line to get them up to this level, to fill them up to this level. But if you notice, with mine, it's a very, very shallow spool. I've only got 100 metres of line on there, very shallow. You need this line to be very, very close to the rim, and then it's much easier to cast. If your line is right in the bottom of a deep spool, then you get a lot of friction as you go to cast out. And the, the, the reel itself, as I said, I actually mark inside. I don't know if you can see that there. I actually mark inside and this one says 0.14 millimetre. That's, all I do is put the diameter of the line. I, th I, I think I consider that more important than the braking strain because the thickness of the line dictates to the size of the float. You know, a heavier line, you need a bigger float. So always look for the diameter. And it's a lovely smooth action reel. The bail arm, you have the option, which I think is good, of, of either clicking it over with the reel or flicking it with your hand and I think that's important as well. You can actually flick it over manually or you can turn the reel handle to do it. So you've got, there you've got a, a double feature. You can do either with the anti-reverse at the back which you can click on and off. Normally when I'm fishing with a waggler I will have the anti-reverse off so I can back mine straight away, that's normal. Um, but odd occasions you can have the anti-reverse on not really necessary. And then you've got your clutch setting at the rear, here, and it's got the numbers actually on the back as, uh, for the braking strain of the line, but I usually check by pulling, pulling on the front, and you can just feel that going off. So a little bit of trial and error there depending on the size of fish you're catching, but a good idea to always set it. You've got your back wind, but for that big, powerful thrust from the fish, the clutch can then kick in. So you've got a double, a double sort of, you've got a double way of, of playing the fish. You know, a, a big fish, a big surge, it won't break you because your clutch will finally go. And that, that is, is basically all you need for waggler fishing. A nice, get a, as light a rod as possible. In fact, depending on your size, I mean, a 12 foot rod is fine for this sort of fishing. I use a 14 foot because it's a bit more flexible, but 12 or 13 foot will be lighter, and particularly if you're smaller, will be easier to use. You know, the, uh, the bigger you are, the, the bigger the, the rod you can manage, but the smaller you are, then a, a nice small rod's fine. And this is a, a brilliant way to start. Just rod and reel, but remember, try and get a match reel, shallow spool. Now I've been fishing with casters and maggots, feeding casters, maggot on the hook. You know, it's 
quite often it's good to start with that just to spark the swim off and caught some early tench and bream and, it, and it's been good but this is a commercial fishery and what happens is that these fisheries in winter when nobody's fishing fishing them they actually get fed with pellets you know so that is their natural bait so i'm changing now to three mil these three mil van der Nijn carp pellets these are just for feeding these are actual fish meal flavor and you'll notice i keep feeding all the time come round, and even though i'm chatting away to camera i need to keep the swim going so i'm putting them in putting more in all the time feeding with those and i'm going to put on the hook i'm going to put these expander pellets now expander pellets are for those of you who don't know they're, they're actually You've probably heard people talk about it and think, oh, and you think, oh, you're, most people are frightened of them, but they are, when you first get them out of the pack, they are rock hard and they float. They really float. They're hard to make sink. And in fact, there's directions on the back of the pack to show you exactly how to do it. But it takes about two or three hours. Now, there's a new development. It's called, well, it, 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 it's called a pump or a, a pellet pump or a bait pump, but it actually, this thing actually sucks the air out of the pellet, pulls the liquid into it, and I'll demonstrate that in a sec, and they sink instantly, sink absolutely in, in, instantly. I want to show you how to do that. You just, all you do, it's so simple. You can get them, they sink immediately, so you get them ready for the hook without any problems. All you do, first of all, is... Now, these are natural pellets. In other words, they've got no flavour. And this particular one, this particular size, are about... These are about six mil. If I put them in there, if I put them in like that, and what I like to add a little bit of flavour to them. This is... I've got a couple of different flavours I can try. This is a, a liquid super scopex which is a very very attractive one and you can put your own whatever one you want you put your own flavor in just a squirt of that in there right that's in there squirt of that and then just add water water out of the lake not tap water i don't like to use tap water at all just pour that water in you'll see all those pellets will come floating to the top if you have a look there if you can see under there everything has tried to come up all you do is seal the lid, seal the lid, then turn the pump upside down. So you've sealed it, everything's trying to float. And this is the bit you actually, they're all floating this way now, you actually suck. And as you pull it, look at all those air bubbles. You actually suck the air. Can you see the air coming out of that? Suck the air out, give it a couple of pumps and suck the water and all your lovely flavours get sucked into it, you know, your favourite flavour. And if you have a look at those now, they've all sunk and I'll put them, I'll just put them in water for you so you can see how they all, just, to, just take a handful of them out so you can see and I'll put them in water here, let's get this, this dish of water up for you and you'll see how they all will sink, every one of them. Everyone sinks immediately, not one floater. I leave them in water for about five minutes, just covered up, strain all the water off. Oh, that's a beautiful smell. Strain all the water off, and then, and then after five minutes, and then they will just gradually soften up. They're still a bit hard, but they are perfect. And there's, there's plenty enough there. They're still hard, but you can put a hook in them, but they will soften up within five minutes and then they're ready for the hook. I've got another one now to show you, which is, because you never can tell what flavour, what flavour do you want? And I'll just run through that again, just so you can see it. These ones are smaller ones. Sometimes fish want big pellets. So I'll just run that through again. Sometimes they want small. These ones are, are three mil. If you have a look at these, these are tiny, but they're the same, they're expander pellets. Just very, very small expander pellets a few into my hand there look little tiny things but they swell up to about three times the size and one once again i sort of you might need to change your flavor so this time i'm using green lip muscle to liquid again put it in you can actually see the green a squirt of that you can use your own flavor if you prefer strawberry use strawberry 
see that green filtering down there. Fill it up with water. So brilliant to use these pumps, fabulous things. Just clip on. Don't forget, once you've clipped that on, to turn it over. Do you see the colour of the liquid? All those pellets now, will, will, at the moment, are coming this way. They want to float and then just suck all the air. Look at that beautiful. Can you see all the air being sucked out of that? Two pumps, they're done. Immediately. I'm going to mix them with the other ones and then I can use whichever ones I want. But there you are, and they're all now sinking. I put them into that pot. Put them into this pot here. Every one of them sinks immediately. Not one floater there. Well, there is one little one. That's all. Brilliant. And all flavoured as you want, and I can pick them out as I want. And now that's what I'm going on to use. Expanding pellets on the hook and feeding with three mil actual fish meal pellets, which is a feeder pellet. <laughs> pellets working. I've actually missed one bite on pellet and then second put in. What is it? Oh, it's a bream. It's a bream. It's on one of those Super Scopex pellets. The big ones, big six mil. I said that fish actually, they get fed on these pellets all the time. So, you know, when you come to a commercial fishery, quite often it's a good bait to use. Lovely little bream. Similar to what we were catching on, Maggot. But probably these, when you look at these fish, they've probably been weaned on pellets, you know, so it's quite obvious that pellet is a good bait for them. Only just hooked. I'm on a bigger hook now, and I'll run through that in a minute with you, but there. Lovely bream, perfect condition again. Beautiful silver fish. Lovely. More where that come from. Great. These breams seem to love pellets. That one actually took it. As the pellet was dropping through the water, you wouldn't think bream would take on the drop, but the way that I've got this, this rig set up, and I'll show it to you in a minute. All the lines just caught around the front of the fish. The way that I've got this rig set up, this waggler really handles it well. It, it can be for fishing on the drop, even though I'm fishing with pellet, I can actually catch these fish. And what, I think it's so warm now, the fish are coming up in the water. It was on a big pellet again, on the drop, as it was dropping through, the fish just took it. It's, only, it's about a 14 ounce, lovely skimmer. Perfectly hooked though. Just hooked in the lip on the drop as you're feeding all the time it's taking it. And this is a different rig to what I was using earlier. So we'll just have a look, a different sort of float, a thick top float, one that's ideal for fishing pellets. So we'll, I'll put this one away and then we'll have a look at the rig. I'm using exactly the same brand of hook that I was using earlier, a Tubertini 808. It's a fine wire, but very, very strong, so light. But I'm using it in a size 16. I'm fishing with pellet now, so you need a larger hook. You need to get a, a bigger part of that meat of the hook in the pellet. You know, the inertia that it takes to actually cast a waggler, if the hook's too small, it will just pull out of a soft pellet, so you need a slightly larger hook, but you can get away with it. You know, if you increase the size of your bait, go up on your hook size, much better. And I've also gone up on my line size. I've now put an 015, it's Browning Senatan, 015 mil, which is about four and a half pound breaking strain. So I've toughened everything up a bit. I've got a hook length, which is about 18 inches long. And in the middle of that hook, right in the middle, I've got a number eight shot right in the middle. That's my telltale shot. That is my bite indicator. You know, if the fish lifts that, I see it. If it pulls it, the, the float goes under. And then going along further, 
I've got a number 30, and I always use this wherever possible, a number 30 barrel swivel, and there I've got a five turn half blood knot, and it's tucked, tucked half blood knot. I'll show you how to tie that in a minute, because it's, it's so important, you know, it will not, I can put all the pressure I want on that, and it won't break. So I've tucked around there, tucked half blood. Onto the main line, so that, that, that really then, we're onto the main line, which is a bit thicker now. I've gone up to a 0.16 millimeter main line, which is about five or six pound breaking stone. So really, really strong line. And I've got two more number, number eight shot there, two more, just equally spaced. When you're waggler fishing, try to get as much of the weight under the float as possible or in the float. I see so many people casting with big shots all the way down the line and that is a recipe for tangles. So what I do is I try to use a loaded float. I mean this swim is about five or six foot deep so I try to use a loaded float that's the casting power and then light shot and good job I was using light shot down the line because that last fish actually took the bait as it dropped through the water. But you can, you'll find that if you have everything under the float, all the weight, much easier to cast, and I'll fish here all day without one tangle. So get all the bulk of your weight, and in this, I've got the same float as before, or the same type of float with this actual adjustable weight underneath. I can pull it out and chop and change it, do what I want, with a little float attachment also, where I can change it. No pressure on the line whatsoever. The line runs through here, and a couple of little twists around here, it will not move, but you can cast all day, and it doesn't matter how big the fish are, it will not break. The other alternative to this, of course, is to put two little shots either side of the float, but if you're catching a lot of fish, particularly big fish, it can gradually wear the line and it will break. So if you can, go out and buy one of these float attachments. They're really well worth it, and then you can just adjust it. Now the float, because I'm fishing a big bait, which is dragging on the bottom and can drag the float under, the float actually is a, what they call a straight peacock. It's a Drenham float again, but you can see there's no insert, so there's more buoyancy in the tip. So when you have your bait dragging on the bottom, it won't drag the float under. But of course, when you get a bite, it will shoot under. So a thicker tip float, bigger bait, everything increased in size. Just move round a bit so there's a bit better light so that you can see this knot because it's, it's one that I think is very important. It's called a tucked half blood and it's a knot that I use to attach my hook length to a barrel swivel or the main line to a barrel swivel. So it's exactly the same knot. You do five turns. Actually, what you do is you, you thread the line through the swivel. I've already done that just to save a bit of time. That's threaded through. And then the loose end there, which is about two or three inches long, twist that round about five, you can five or six times, I usually do it five times. So you get the line, I know it's ever so hard for you to see this, and, and every time you twist it, let me change hands there so you can see, every time you twist it, one, two, you have to actually hold the barrels with, the, with your left hand, three, four, five so every time you twist it right you're holding the swivel and that little loop of line with your thumb and your forefinger of your left hand as long as you're normally right-handed then you're left once you've twisted it five times you're left with this little tag see this little tag here tuck that back through that loop right put it through that loop as you put it through that loop what you'll find is I've put it through that loop now I've then left with another loop here now, if you just pull it now, it will slip, but if you tuck this, still the same little end piece, tuck it back through, and this is where the word tucked comes from. So just tuck it any way, it doesn't matter, you can tuck it any direction, as long as it comes through that loop. So get it there, pull it back through, through the loop, so that's a tucked. Pull it down. Now, as you pull it down, all knots need just a little bit of, uh, lubricant so I just wet my fingers just will lubricate the line then pull it pull it pull it pull it tight I just grab my clippers and then I can 
trim off that little end to make a perfect knot. Just trim that quite tight, just you can leave a little tag, and that is a perfect and incredibly strong. You can pull that, I mean, knot strength is so important with lines. You can pull that as hard as you want, it will not go. So you've got a perfect knot that will not break. There is another alternative way, if you haven't got a barrel swivel or if you don't use them, of, of tying or attaching that main line to the hook length. And that is probably the most common one. It's called loop to loop. But what a lot of anglers do, they don't know how to tie a loop properly. And I'll, I'll just show you how weak line can be if you don't use the correct knot. I'll just, and this is, this is the knot that most anglers use when they're doing a the loop. They fold the line over like that, and then they put the line round their fingers, two fingers, like that, and they pull this little loop through here, like that, wet it of course, like that, pull it tight and they think, oh, that's a lovely loop to loop. But that is not a correct one because what happens is, and I'll just show you here, now this line is four and a half pound breaking strain, but what, I'll show you what happens if you don't tie the correct knot, how easy it can break, right? No pressure on that, bang, as easy as that. Four and a half pounds, no problem. The knot you must use, and it's so simple, is a is it an overhand loop. So you do the same thing, right? You fold your line just the same. So you've got your loop. You actually have got your two fingers there, the thumb behind it, and you form this loop that you would always do when you're doing that. It's a granny knot, that other one actually, but loads of people use it. So you've got a loop and that. Now this time, bring this piece of line back and bring it back through here. It's then not cutting in on itself. So you bring it back, right? You bring it round, you bring it, so you put it away from you, bring it round and you bring it back. You bring this little loop back through the line there. Let me show you. Bring it back and through like that. And you get, if you look at it then, you get a sort of a, like a figure of eight. If you can just see it there, sort of a figure of eight and wet it again, pull it tight. We've got a figure of eight loop now, and that is much stronger. If you do that test on there now, right, put that line on there and test it. You test it. And pull and pull and pull, and you can't break it. It's incredibly strong. That's the difference. Just that figure of eight loop, now you won't lose any more fish. Just do that. These bream certainly love pellets, but I've got good, strong tackle on. You can always tell a bream, you know, they, they just fight a bit different. But I've got good, strong tackle. This is a, like a 14 foot rod. Fairly light in the tip, but still powerful. And once you get bream on the surface, you know, they're not a problem. Not a problem, they just come, oh dear. That one, that one decided to flick a bit. <laughs> Oh dear, just, I just found out it's been hooked. I don't know why though, because I was putting a lot of pressure on it. But once you, usually once you get them on the top, then just, just pull them, lift them, slide the net underneath. And this one's quite active, but they're, they're much of a much, you see. They're lovely, actually they're quite meaty fish, almost look at them, perfect condition, perfect condition. And just probably about a pound, that one. Took that, pe took that pellet again on the drop. You know, as you're feeding, as with this slow rig, I've just got these sort of one, two, three, number 10 shots and this swivel. So it drops through the water slowly down to the bottom. And there, another lovely little bream. These, these bream are going, oh, this feels like a good one. Just going mad, they must, you know what I said earlier about that, they're, they're fed on pellets, so they love them. It's another one of they, these skimmers. The thing is, this tackle is so strong. You saw how when I pulled on that knot, how strong it was. 
once you get these bream to, there's a good fish, once you get them to the top, well, they start to flick a little bit then, but look, they've done, you know, you've got them. <laughs> Beautiful, these are all very, very similar size, they're about pound fish. Absolutely perfect condition though. Perfect, beautiful fish. Taking that six mil expander pellet with that super, super Scopex mix. Once again, be, you know, be very kind to the fish. Try to make sure that if there's anything about a problem with the hook, then use your disgorger. Use your disgorger so you don't damage it. But a beautiful condition. Glistening, glistening. Lovely, absolutely perfect fish. But the tackle really, you know, is, is really good. I've had to put the tackle for catching bigger fish, you know, carp and big tench. And obviously it handles those bream so, so easily. Straight out and into another fish. He's, they're just going mad now. Really, come on, I've been feeding these three mil fish meal pellets. And they're just, the fish are just going mad. Feels like a bream, but maybe a bit bigger, this one. Good, strong tackle, that rod really bent round. Thumping away, you, you get a lovely, do you know when you're using rod and line, you get a lovely feel through the rod itself. Oh, this looks like a bigger sample. Bream again, but just, just heard the clutch sort of give a tweak then. Oh yes, a bigger bream. But they love these pellets. Look at that rod curve right round. I'm putting a lot of pressure on this fish. Really wants to go diving. Once you get bream to the top, oh, that's a lovely fish. Once you get them to the top, then you can just a nice, steady pull. There, nice, steady pull. Oh. <laughs> This is a real lively one. I can't believe this. Oh, he's up on top now. Just tremendous catch of these fish. <laughs> oh, that's a bigger sample. That's why it went harder. Oh. oh, lovely, lovely fish. Once again, just perfectly hooked. Oh, it's got some of those little, once again, Look at those little, I've seen it on an earlier fish, little spawning nodules, just to start, that's a good sample. Two pound of that, taking pellet though. And every time now, every time I go in with this light rig dropping through the water, they're taking it on the drop. As Soon as I went out there, round it went again. Another lovely bream. This is terrific fishing. But when you're picking, when you think to yourself, now what colour top should I use today for my waggler? Look at, at what the background is that you're fishing into and also look at the, the actual sun. Now today I've actually got the sun now is almost coming from my right, right shoulder onto the float. If, it, if your sun is sort of coming from your back onto the float, yellow is a brilliant colour. If it's in your face then it's more difficult to see. If you've got purely white water, purely a white background, then, then black is a very good colour. And consequently, if you've got a very dark background, then a dark red is a very good colour. So you just swap, always make sure you can see your float properly. So select the right colour tip for the right conditions. Don't be straining to see the float. You want to see those little bobs, those little knocks, when the float just, they just went there didn't go properly though, I'm going to leave it. Just a little dig. Sometimes it's a fish bashing the line. Just can never tell, but just a little, a little bash. As I feed, if I feed some, there it goes. Oh, just missed that fish. And you can miss an odd one on pellet, obviously. They're such big fish, but I don't know if you saw that float just whiz away and I missed the bite. Could have been Mr. Big that one, but, but that happens in fishing. Even Bob Nudd misses a bite or two.
but at least we know the fish are there. We'll go straight back out again, another pellet. Nice soft overhead cast I'm doing now. Soft because I've got soft pellet on. Nice soft overhead cast and then I'm sinking the line quite slowly because I've got pellet on. I'm actually dipping the tip of the rod under the water and then winding the reel handle down very slowly until I get to where I'm feeding those pellets. All the lines sunk. The float needs to be very still, so I've sunk all the line, pulled, cast past where I'm fishing and feeding, and then feed pellets again around the float area. A couple of pouch fulls and then just sit and wait. As those pellets hit the water, look at that, the float bang already. As those pellets hit the water, of course, the fish hear it and they home in and then all you've got to do is wait for the bite. And quite often if they're whizzing around, of course, as they have been today, they take it on the drop. <laughs> I'm in again. Well, this feels like a good fish. Oh, big fish. No, prob probably a bream, I think, because you can tell with carp, they whiz off. But I'm just winding it steadily because just in case, but it feels a real dead weight, you know, a real thump, thump, thump. <laughs> this is great fishing. I think, though, I think probably, if I get this one in, we'll probably end on this one, because it's been a terrific day. I just hope you've learned something about waggler fishing today. That is, oh, look at that for a breeze. That is a lovely one to finish on. That's a biggie. Oh, it's probably about four pound, that. Maybe more. <laughs> <laughs> what a lovely fish to finish up on. That is a proper breed. Look at that. You wouldn't, you wouldn't think they'd take pellets, would you? You just wouldn't think you'd think it's bream, worms and that, but lovely once again, that lovely Super Scopex pellet. <laughs> That's a proper jobby, that, isn't it? Nice and steady though, bringing it in. The waggler handled it perfectly. Got a perfect bite and there's a the result. But did you see how easy it was to tame it with that waggler rod? You know, you've got full control all the time while you're bringing the fish in. And look at that, a four pound bream. A lovely fish to finish up on. I'll put this in and then I'll just show you how to, to actually put fish back without damaging them. We'll see roughly what we've got. I won't weigh them, but Oh, I've had well over 20 or 30 pounds today. Look at that, beautiful fish. Look at that, a terrific bag of fish. It just shows you what you can do, what you can catch with the waggler. Just nice, steady fishing and probably well over 30 pounds of fish there. Now, just make sure, I just want to show you, when you want to release the fish, get the fish to the front of your net while they're under the water. So get all the fish, I've gathered them up, got them right to the front of the net before you release them so that you don't actually lift them at all. They're all pulled to the, to the front of the net under the water and then you can just release them steady. Look at them lovely bream, tench, roach. <laughs> lovely net of fish. <laughs> and then just release them carefully there. Look at that big bream there. That's the one we caught last of all. What a fabulous day's fishing on the Waggler. Another good day's work. He really is the daddy of the game. We'll see you again at the lakeside. Yeah.